It's time to learn the limit laws. Think of these as some sort of distributive laws for combining limits with the four fundamental arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. The most important thing to keep in mind through this entire video is that we need to assume that the limits of the functions f and g both exist at the point a. None of the laws are true without this assumption. In fact, we'll see an example of why that's the case. The first two laws deal with addition and subtraction. Law 1 says that the limit of the sum of f and g is the sum of the individual limits. Notice that a is the same for all three limits in this expression. This law says that you can distribute the limit to each term in the sum. Similarly, law 2 says that the limit of the difference of f and g is the difference of the limits. It's the same thing as law 1, only now we're subtracting g. Let's take a look at an example. If we want to find the limit of x squared plus e to the x as x approaches 3, then we can look at the limit of each part separately. This becomes 9 plus e cubed. The 9 is the limit of x squared, and the e cubed is the limit of e to the x. We haven't justified that last step formally, but you can justify it graphically as we did in the first video, as long as you know what the graphs of these functions look like. We'll see another way to justify it in the next video. A special case of these two laws occurs when one of the functions, let's say f, is a constant. So if we let f of x equal c, then the laws become these two statements. Something similar happens when g is constant. Let's justify law 1a graphically. Remember this graph from the previous videos. The points near a are mapped to points near l, which is the intuitive idea behind saying that the limit of f at a is l. But now, let's slide the function up by c. Those same points around a are now mapped to points on the y-axis that are also shifted up by c, so the new limit is l plus c. You might be wondering why we need to assume that the limits of f and g exist. Let's look at an example that shows us why. If f of x and g of x are both 1 over x, then the limit of f of x minus g of x at 0 is the limit of 1 over x minus 1 over x, which is always 0 as long as x isn't 0, and the limit of that is 0 everywhere. But neither the limit of f nor the limit of g exists at 0, which we saw in the previous video. So it doesn't make any sense to write this, since both terms are undefined. In short, sometimes you can combine two functions with no limit at a into a function that does have a limit at a. This is why you need to be careful when using the limit laws. Don't be tempted to split two functions into separate limits, and then say that the limit of something like f plus g doesn't exist because the individual limits don't exist. The limit laws don't let you do this. There are two more limit laws for the remaining two operations. Law 3 says that the limit of a product is the product of the limits, and law 4 says that as long as the limit of g isn't 0, then the limit of a ratio is the ratio of the limits. Once again, we have special cases when one of the functions is constant. So if we let f of x equal c, then laws 3 and 4 become these statements. All four limit laws and their special cases, too, can be proven by using the formal definition of a limit. The good news about the limit laws is that they tell us that we can often do what we'd probably be tempted to do, even if we'd never heard of them. But we can't be careless. We need to remember that the limit of each function must exist before we can use a limit law. And in the case of division, we also need to make sure that we don't divide by a limit that's equal to zero. In this video, we saw that the limit laws are very useful tools for evaluating limits. In the next video, we'll discuss continuity. It's an interesting topic in its own right, but in particular, it'll be another useful tool for dealing with limits.